so in today's society, people all look at these people as like they're they're aloof and they're yeah. kind of like floating through space yeah. and they're entitled and no one has everyone's trying to find their purpose and their passion. No one knows what that is. Uh, my answer would be like one hundred percent no. Mm. Do not help people try and find their passion. Um, passion is not something you find. It just, you don't find you don't like flip over a rock and be like there is my passion oh my god thank you patrick mm -hmm. so much for pointing Probably, me towards that rock yeah exactly yeah. amazing yeah it's developed through a lot of trial and error so what you want to do is get people to try a bunch of different things and through over as you said over time mm -hmm. and exposures that's where it comes so what you want to do is help people leadership to me is getting people to where they could not go on their own that's what we're trying to do we are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to Five, live on the run, four, always three, chasing, two, never one, stopping. Go. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. I'm here as always with Ben. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, Patrick. Today we're going to take a couple of questions that folks sent me um, for two-minute drills, but I think that there's enough similarity and a, enough meat there to try to get a whole episode out of it. And the subject or the folks of the, of the, of the episode is going to be um, folks who are in a position to lead um, teenagers or kids in some way um, and, and, and your advice, your tips on how to do that effectively, how to be a leader to uh, a pretty unique population. And we've talked a lot about, um, we've talked about leadership in affiliates and in business and in, in other, other areas, but I think that there's something unique about this age group that, uh, at least to me, I'm curious if you approach it any differently than you mm -hmm. do um, a 27 year old coach over at the gym, whatever it might be. So I've got, we're gonna start off the episode, I've got two questions that I'm gonna read off. We'll, do, we'll take them uh, one at a time, um, but that, those are the, the sparks for this conversation. We'll see, we'll see where it goes from there. The first question uh, from a listener is, I will be teaching a course next year to seventh graders called Study Skills, and we'll be applying a lot of the same concepts you talk about on the podcast to this course. This is a class they are forced to take. How do you how do you create buy-in and get them to want to chase excellence and achieve more for themselves if they aren't on board initially? Good question. That was a long <laughs> pause because I was like, where are you? Okay, so... Um, Love for the first thing that came through my mind was like I love that this class exists, yeah, me too. right? Like teaching people how to learn. I'm, I'm assuming that's what it is when it says yep. like study, study skills. skills. Yeah. Like that to me is one of the missing links. I took a class when I was in middle school called Study for Success, which mm. sounds like very similar, but it was this kind of like throwaway class, and it was really for the kids that like needed the help, which yeah. I was one of. Yep. Everyone else didn't take it. I was like one of six kids that were doing like, but it's a class I remember like the most. Mm. It's like, that's what we should be teaching people is not how to memorize things because today's age, like yeah. it's what a useless skill that is when I can pull out my pocket and find every yep. stat I need to figure out. We should be teaching people how to learn and solve problems, think creatively. And um, so I love that this class exists. So how do we create um, buy-in yeah. when um, it's a class that's mandated they must take? So here's um, like... Uh, a, a similarity might be how do we create buy-in for like um, somebody that joins like the infantry in the military? Like right. they're forced to be there. They have to be there. Um, how do you do that? And it's all, to me, that's about like creating the culture. And it's one of the things that I really love is like this idea of culture is created. It's not something that forms on itself by its own. It's not a manifestation. It's not a result. It is a purposeful action. Yeah. And you, I whoever this this listener is, um, I, I'm, I'm so excited that this is one of our listeners because they're asking all the right questions, right? Um, how do you create the buy-in? Like the way to do that first and foremost for me is to make these kids, and one opportunity to do this with kids is to um, get them to understand that they, the growth mindset, mm -hmm. which is nothing that they have is fixed. So when I was growing up and I was taking this type of class, it was you are taking this class because you struggle with school yep. like it's fixed you struggle with school you need the extra help instead of like here are the tools that you can we're going to learn that's going to make you better 
So a few kind of like buzzwords is like instill that growth mindset. It's not fixed. You can learn this. You can be better at it. Next one is like begin with the end in mind. If you do this, here's where we're going to end up. Here's what you can do. Create that inspiration behind everything. And then ignite the flame by making them excited. And that's going to come through your own passion. And if there's ever been like a, a, a watchdog that can sniff this out, it's kids. So yeah. you're, it's got to be real and authentic. Don't try to be passionate if you're not. And then from there, reward the little steps along the way. So when they have little successes, celebrate them for sure. When they see, when they have failures or mistakes or mess ups, celebrate those even more because that's the thing that's going to get us to where we want to go. You have to like in double down on the effort, which is what the growth mindset's all about, right. and forget about the results. It's all about are they digging into the process, and once they're touching their toe into the the pool of the process, you got to like be all over that, be so excited because that's what's going to get them where they want to go. Almost ignoring the re, the, the end result and the yeah. place we're going at the end. Uh, I'm curious, uh, w again, thinking about this age group, would you, would you advise this teacher or somebody in this position um, focusing on the, the growth and fixed mindset? Would you advise them to talk directly about the differences between a focus or a, a, a fixed and a growth mindset? Or would you say you need to understand this so that you can instill in them the philosophy of it, but let's not get them, let's not confuse them or scare them off with, with these labels. Yeah. In other words, is, do you feel like it would be helpful for them to understand, oh, there's a thing called a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, and I want a growth mindset? Or is it just that the teacher needs to understand it so that they can recognize how can I reward the moments of growth mindset and how can I point out and try to push away those moments of fixed mindset? Yeah, I, I think that's um, um, probably individually based on what the teacher feels the age group is and yeah. the, what yep. the, the understanding of the students. Because you could relabel it like talent versus learning, Sure, right? Like a lot of people think like, oh, you're such a good reader mm -hmm. versus like, we can become a better reader. It's like, it's what you reward and it's the teacher's own words that are going to manifest itself in the minds of the students. Teachers have so much influence into creating the growth or no one's born with a fixed or growth mindset. Right. It's from the words and the experiences we have. When a teacher hands back a paper and says, very nice job on this, Patrick, you're really smart. They're instilling the fixed mindset. Yep. You are either, you did well on this because you are smart, as opposed to saying, really nice job on this, Patrick. You worked very hard. Mm -hmm. You're instilling the growth mindset. It's about your effort and the work you put into it. The number one thing I would do, if it doesn't matter if I'm a teacher of study for success or study skills, a teacher of math or history, if I'm a principal, if I am a parent, or I'm a coach of CrossFit Games athletes, the number one objective I'm going to try to do is create this environment of learning and where mistakes are okay so that we can grow and get better. It's got to be this 360 degree all the time feedback loop yeah. system, which is here's where we are. Here's where we're going. Here's what we can do better. Here's where we're going. Here's where we are. Here's what we can do. Here's where we can make it better. And you're going to get the feedback along the way. And the feedback is not because you're not good enough. It's because feedback makes us better. And that's what we're striving for. I don't care where we are today. Kid walks in today and he, he reads at a, a fourth grade level and he's a sophomore in, in high school. It's not about the fourth grade level. It's about what we're doing to make it better. If you harp on that, it's like, you're still at a fourth grade level. Like, like all the kid hears is like, I'm dumb, I'm dumb, I'm dumb. As opposed to like, you're working really hard. I love the effort you put in this. And like, it's gotta be about effort and not results. Yeah, it feels like so much of the challenge for the teacher is to make sure that they truly understand the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset so that they ne there's never an instance where they let one slip when they shouldn't. Yeah, you know and let's I mean? let's expand this outside the walls of a teacher. Let's turn this into parents. Mm. Like, what an opportunity for parents, right? Kid comes home with a report card and has, you know, um, um, straight A's and a and a B plus. And you go, what happened with the B plus? Like, what are you instilling there, yeah. right? Or you just come, a kid comes home with a test and they got a ninety five. And parents say it all the time. It's like, what happened to the other five points? Yeah. Or they come home with those straight A's or the B or the 95, and you say, really nice job, Patrick. You're smart. Mm -hmm. You're rewarding the smarts, which is this thing you're born with that you can't fix, you can't change in their minds, mm -hmm. as opposed to really nice job, Patrick. You've worked really hard to get those grades. Now they hear, 
I need to work hard. Mm -hmm. Change, like it's really important for us as authority figures, teachers, parents, employers, whatever it might be, to understand the power of our words and how it's going to manifest itself in, in, in our workers, in our employees, in our kids, in our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to point out the, uh, part of the reason why you, you know, that idea of like, you're so smart is that when they get up, when, when the kid especially gets to a point where their quote unquote smarts isn't enough, yeah. then they pull back and they say, if, I can't fail yeah, because so what's I'm the, the danger smart of that, kid. Right? Yeah. What's the danger? So this is the flip side. This yeah. is not the kids that need study for success. This is the kids that excel as yeah. it is. So this is what happens is kids, you know, you have the top scorer on the basketball team, mm -hmm. you know, all through high school. He's the kid that scores 30 points every game. Then he goes to a division one college. Well, guess what happens when he goes to division one college? Harder. Yeah, he's with all the kids that score 30 points in a game. Right. So now this kid that like, you're so fast, you're yep. so good at basketball, you're so talented. So all through high school, he, that's his identity. Yep. I'm good at basketball. I'm so smart. I'm so fast. I'm such a good shooter. He gets to basketball and the defense goes up 15 notches from what it was in high school. Everyone's quick. Everyone's fast. If he's not the kid that was learning instead, wow, Patrick, you score 30 points a game. It's because you work so yep. freaking hard in practice and you put in so much time into this. Man, like, all of a sudden, then now he's the learner. He's yeah. the doer. He's the grower. Yep. He's the hustler. As opposed to the kid that you got to instill the right path if you want the right reactions when they come against those adversities and those challenges. Yeah, got it. Okay. Second question from a listener. I have four daughters aged four to 12 and we homeschool. I'm formatting our, our PE uh, for this fall and wondered what guidelines you would suggest for these ages. We'll, we'll also be swimming laps. Um, we have a rack, a rower, jump ropes, et cetera, in our garage. My main goal is making fitness a part of who they are. Uh, we also like to bike and hike and help them strengthen safely. So the, qu the question I think embedded in there is um, outside of the biking and the hiking and the swimming, they're in the garage some number of times per week with this age group. How would you, how would you structure a, really a gym class for these kids probably that they're all doing it together. That's kind of part yeah. of the fun and all that. So how would you, how would you advise, um, uh, this mom to, to, or dad, or I actually uh, read it as a dad. Oh, did you? I'm yeah. pretty sure it's a mom. Yeah. Um, how, how would you structure that so that it's fun, so that it's engaging, so that they look forward to it. And so that they get, they, I think they, I internalized it because I was like, if I was homeschooling, what would I do? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. First off, like, Again, like for no, the, like these these questions are coming from like really yeah, awesome people. Really, yeah, exactly. Yeah, really cool really people. Really exciting to see. Yep. Um, so I would say you, um, you're doing it. Like yeah. you're like already like the idea of like we swim laps, we go hiking and biking, and we're doing stuff also in the garage. Like right there, you're at an A level. I love it. Now, if we're gonna chase excellence, what's the highest? Thing that what what else should we be looking for? Um, but right now, like phenomenal. Like I almost wish that like I was like <laughs> flying the wall and yeah. seeing what was going on. Like not only in when, during PE, but and also the fact that they're putting so much focus into PE yeah. when they're homeschooling. Yep. It's not just like you go to school and then you play recreational soccer. They're actually ah, it's just like there's so many good things yeah. with this. Yep. Um, what what I would the first thing I would do, which um, might have been skipped in this, is and I, maybe it's inherent in this like we want to make fitness a part of their lives, is to make it fun. Like mm -hmm. that's just like where it's got to be this thing. Like if there's a lot of pressure, if like you, if it's like you have to, if there's a lot of competition and they're not competitive kids, maybe half the kids are competitive and the other half aren't. Like yeah. you got to make it in this environment that they're going to thrive and look forward to. It's not a chore. So different strokes, different folks, different kids. Like, so one kid might be all about like competition. So then you create this like little scoring system and yeah. PRs and tracking and all this stuff. Other kid might, that might scare them off completely. And for them, it's more about, it's an obstacle course and we would like compete to complete. Mm -hmm. And it's that type of thing. I would first and foremost, make sure it is a rewarding experience for them mm -hmm. so that they are looking forward to this each and every time. Obviously, there's the individual approach from there. After you go from that, then it comes to like some of the principles of training kids in a gym environment, which is, um, you know, just like the normal 
foundations of what we do in CrossFit. It's about um, range of motion. It's about fundamental movements. It's about um, constant variance. It's about um, relative intensity, all those type of things. So I would make sure that they're moving with the, the right mechanics, you know, that, they're, that they're, their lifts look good. And it's starting off with super light weights, meaning like a PVC, right? Like, um, and then from there, um, and this is obviously like once we've gotten past, like, like we just move, like, yep. it's like you move, but if we're yep. going to get these kids at 11 years old, that's where, the, which one of the kids yep, up the to 12. 12. Yep. yep. Um, at 12 is where we start be introducing some of these, like, okay, we're going to learn how to do a squat with some weight on our back. Um, and then I like the, the coach Bergner approach when he was coaching his kids is we can increase weight when you consistently show me perfect reps. Mm-hmm. Once they're perfect with that load, we'll go up by five pounds. And then let's see perfect. And we'll hang out until it's perfect. Now, perfect is an arbitrary term. Yeah. Um, but really, it's like, can we consistently move incredibly, incredibly well? And if there's a fault in the movement pattern, like there's no reason to go up and wait. Yep. Um, I just think that there's so much, you know, I see even even in our gym, um, you know, we have teenagers lifting and they're, they're lifting too heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we should be um, really incentivizing good movement patterns. Um, some of the other things, which I love is they're swimming and they're hiking and they're biking, is I, I would do things like, you know, I would love to bring in um, like a meditative yoga practice mm. into that, mm-hmm. you know, which is maybe like um, something that somebody might not see at first blush, but like this, there's a yin and the yang to it, right? Like you can bring this, but exercise doesn't need to always be um, balls to the walls, all out everything you got. There can be this like, practice component this mindfulness component and bringing that awareness to it at an early age and being like this is part of the deal um i think would set them up for success a lot in the future years um before we go on just a a little thing because i really liked what you said about thinking about the individual kid and making sure that Mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is you're doing is kind of tailored towards whether it's something that they'd be they you know whether it's fun or whatever where in that range uh that age range between four and twelve is it is at some point like the four and the twelve year old shouldn't be doing the same thing? Is it is it is it possible that the four and that all four kids get to do the same yeah. you know quote unquote workout um, at the same time, or is there just something about the ages there where you would recommend like okay the four year old is not going to do what the twelve year old is going to do? Or I would um, so I can speak. To, I have a five and a seven year old right now. Um, I also have a nineteen and a fifteen year old, so mm-hmm. I've kind of been through that yep. side as well. So I've seen kind of like what it looks like having a teenager and a um, like a pre-K yep. kid um, at the same time. I think it takes a, it's beyond it would, that having those that big of a spectrum four to 12 working out together in the, that would be on be that would be beyond my capabilities as a coach. Mm-hmm. So maybe with a really good skilled coach that could happen. Um, so I'm not saying it's something that this person would need to separate. Mm -hmm. I would not be able to do that. I'm not good enough with kids to be able to do that. I would do much better with, um, four five and six year olds, Mm -hmm. maybe add a seven year old into that. But then I think a seven year old would do better with the 12, four is just, and maybe I'm using my own kids as an (laughs) example, but I think like seven and eight is when it starts to happen. Okay. Um, I think underneath that six I think that um, you're not letting kids grow at the way that they grow. You know, you don't even, they don't even know who they are. And I think you're trying to like, um, you know, let's say like, um, I'll give it like a concrete example. Of this. Let's say like trying to get a kid to learn how to lift weights at that age. Like it's like, they just don't even know how to move themselves yeah. really that well at that age. Where a seven or eight year old at that time, they're playing like, they're playing town soccer and stuff yeah. like that. It's a little bit different. They have a little more, coordination, accuracy, balance, and mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff. Um, a little bit of a thought experiment because we're, uh, as it relates to the, this conversation that we're having, if I were to give you, and maybe you've touched on some of the answers already in, in the answers that you've given, but if I were to able, if I were to give you, you know, carte blanche on a, on a class of, let's call, let's say sophomores or juniors in high school. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the school says, Ben, we trust you, whatever you want to do mm. as it relates to their training, um, you can do it. Uh, it's up to you. Just, you know, don't hurt the kid or don't hurt, hurt the kids. What would that, what would that training program look like? Sort of soup to nuts. Like, like where would you begin? Assume that they're not all, 
Um, you know, they're not all future games yep. competitors, right? So there's there's that mix there. But where would you focus your energies as the as the coach um, to get them healthier? Full circle back to the original answer where the yeah. first place I would start is like, this is not a fixed thing. Yep. I would instill this idea like we're doing this because we can grow and we can get better and you're gonna get feedback along the way. If I was to take, a, 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 you said a group of athletes. So yep. the first thing I'm gonna do is create a, if I have a group of anybody, whether it's um, high schoolers, it's um, corporate executives, or it's a military unit or a D1 football team. That is a group of people. I'm going to instill a certain culture into that. It doesn't happen by mistake. Like it's purposeful by the leader. And that culture I would create is one of learning and growing and feedback. If I'm going to be a coach, I need to create this environment where the people are coachable. Mm. There's nothing more frustrating than having this person that wants to make things better, but that it's all falling on deaf ears because you haven't instilled the culture that this is what we do here is we take feedback and grow and we, that's by far and away the most important thing I would do. That's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. It's never like, it's like a check the box, got it, it's done. Yeah. It's ongoing. But there's a lot of things we can do. First one maybe is talking about growth mindset, but talking about the feedback loop and the mm -hmm. iteration and the growth and what we're trajectorying towards. And, all of that would be the foundational thing. Now, I'm going to say it's a little off beat. From no, what no. Uh, yeah. But the thing I would do first and foremost is establish this culture of um, what this thing looks like. From there, I would create, this is definitely not probably what you're looking for. You're probably looking for like, I would do thrusters. No. I would create, I would create standards of excellence. I would create mm -hmm. a, like um, what what is acceptable and what is not acceptable um, I would create like this thing with them. I would get mm -hmm. them involved in the process of like, this is, now that we know who we are as a team, what is the things that we're going to try to, what are the things we're going to operate by? So um, being late, being on time. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but maybe that's one of the things. I would say like, when we sit down to talk, do we all kind of just like, do some people stand up or do we sit at, you know, sit Indian style and like, or are we more like a martial arts studio? Or how how is this thing going to operate? I would bring some consistency to the operation. Mm -hmm. Then from there, um, that's where I might kind of lay in like the actual program of yeah. what this thing looks like. Yeah, before we, uh, and we can get into that if you think it's valuable. What, Where would you, given the context uh, that I sort of set up where you're in a school, say, yep. and training, where does all of those, in relation to those things you just laid out, where does the conversation about... Um, why do we care about our health? Why do we care about our fitness? Why are we doing this yeah, in the first place? Like, great. Do you just, do you, is that, you know, bleed that in okay. to those conversations? Yes. Or is that like step three, we actually start no, talking about? No, no, it's actually, it's actually probably something I miss. So here's my take on leaders. This is it. All these questions are questions of leadership, yeah. right? The first, second, third, they're all questions of leadership. So the way I would actually, the way I think about leadership is CVS, culture, vision, and standards. So we talked about the culture. We talked about the standards. The one I missed is what you're laying out, which is the vision. Mm. Like this is what we're trying to create. This is why this is important. This is the approach that this is where it fits into your lives. This is what's going to be available to you if you do that. So once you create those things and you can't skip over that step, like these things are really massively important. Once you get the buy-in from there, then the coaching part's kind of easy. Yeah. And then from there, I would go into like the first thing I would talk about is um, nutrition. Mm. You know, if I, if I have carte blanche, I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to create health in this community, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gonna take up a lot of what we talk about. Yeah. Um, it's it's by far and away the number one thing. You know, if they ate, if everybody in the school ate perfectly, but never did anything more than walking to school and back from school with a backpack every day, we'd probably be okay. Yeah. If they did um, the best CrossFit workout in the world for 20 minutes every day, but ate horrifically, we're not gonna be okay. Yeah. So I would talk about nutrition. I would start really simple with like, what is real food? Um, what is overeating look like? And um, how much, um, you know, what is the, the value of adding some plants to mm -hmm. that diet? Mm -hmm. So that's what I would start, you know, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, from there, I would go into um, variants. I would go into like, I wouldn't go like, here's Fran, here's thrusters. I would go into like, Let's make this thing enjoyable. And if I have carte blanche, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach people probably um, how to swim. Mm. It, Interesting. 
again, it's about saving people's lives. Yeah. That's the life-saving one, right? Like that's the one that's most important yep. by far. Yep. So if you don't know how to do, um, you know, if you don't know how to do a, a, a GHD sit up, like, okay, like you don't know how to do a GHD sit up, but if you don't, it's not gonna, but if you don't know how to swim, mm -hmm. um, that's a major one. So I would teach people how to swim um, because it's the life skill thing. Got it. From there, it would go into some gymnastic stuff in terms of like being able to move your body through space and through a full range of motion. Um, fancy word for like, let's do some squats, push ups, yep. sit ups, and you know, running, um, jumping on boxes, that type of stuff. And then we might get into later on, you know, some of the more nuancey type stuff of, of moving external objects mm -hmm. and um, sports. Got it. Um, you had mentioned that so much of this, or if not all of it is, you know, we're talking about leadership. Um, and as it relates to, to kids and teenagers, you know, leadership specifically is you're, you're leading them. I mean, all leadership is you're leading them towards something, right? And for teens and kids, it's leading them into adulthood, right? How would you tackle, you know, because one thing I think that all kids, a lot of adults struggle with is this notion of, um, you know, what's my purpose? Where's my passion? I don't know how to identify it. Who am I? Where should I be going? And and that, you know, that can be anything from college to professions, yep. all this stuff. So where does that conversation happen in your mind as it relates to a leader of kids and teenagers? Is that something that is important in your mind to to tackle head on? Or is that something that you that you just know, like it comes with time and it comes as naturally as it comes um, or is that something that you can you can you know do on purpose in the same way that you yeah. build a culture? So the the question there is, um, should you help someone find their passion? Yeah, it helps sure. guide them. Yeah, exactly. In this this age range, like, should you be pushing that? And not pushing yeah. maybe the wrong word, but should you? Yeah, be... sure. So sure. in today's society, people all look at these people as like they're they're aloof and they're yeah. kind of like floating through space yeah. and they're entitled and no one has everyone's trying to find their purpose and their passion. No one knows what that is. Uh, my answer would be like 100% no. Mm -hmm. Do not help people try and find their passion. Um, passion is not something you find. It just, you don't find, you don't like flip over a rock and be like, there's my passion. Oh my God. Thank you, Patrick, mm -hmm. so much. For pointing Probably, me towards that rock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's developed through a lot of trial and error. So what you want to do is get people to try a bunch of different things. And through over, as you said, over time mm -hmm. and exposures, that's where it comes. So what you want to do is help people. Leadership to me is getting people to where they could not go on their own. That's what we're trying to do. Yep. So somebody um, is growing as a gymnast, but they find a great coach that brings them three or four levels above where they ever thought they could be. Yep. That's a good leader. Somebody is um, trying to become a, a, a better singer and they find a great singing coach that brings them through. That's what it's about. So we as leaders, what we want to do is help grow people, but we can't tell them their passion. We can't find their passion. We need to help uh, give people the freedom to do that. And sometimes that means allowing people to quit. Yeah. Flies in the face of everything we heard about grit, right? And the, you know, grit is passion um, and persistence over time, like sticking, it's stick to this. It's never quitting. Well, that's a surefire way to burn out. If you never quit something that you are not passionate about, you don't like, like you have to stop. Now, what this means is a better approach is don't allow people to stop halfway through. Mm -hmm. That's so if you're a kid or a high schooler starts cross country because their friends are doing it. And after the first week, they're like, I didn't realize you have to run. <laughs> like that sucks. Yeah. You don't let them quit. Yeah. You signed up for this. You stick it through. That's what we do. That's now you're creating this, this self fulfilling prophecy of like I see things through adversity. That's good. But then at the end of the season, okay, that wasn't for you. That's not something you're passionate about. Let's see if there's something else. And that's to me is okay. And the bigger the repertoire there, the better. We talked about that book that came out recently about um, um, set of keys on the cover. You helped me figure out the name last time. Uh, it's a general. Uh, it's the book about generalists. Um, by David Epstein. Yeah. I think it's I was, I've called general, I think it's called generalists. Um nope, it's probably not. Yeah. But it's about again, it's about like this notion that like we've been ingrained that Tiger Woods approach is right where you find this purpose and passion at age 4 and you go for it. Well, that works really well in a, a controlled environment like golf. What we're finding out better is that people like Roger Federer um 
It's called range, I think. Range, range. that's it. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> Where people like Roger Federer explored everything from water skiing to tennis, yes, but also badminton and skiing and soccer and all these other things. And from that found, and that approach actually has more correlates to other areas like business and yeah. arts and other stuff. What we should be doing is allowing people to find and explore a number of different passions. Now, if somebody finds it, like you find the kid that it is a sophomore and is just this like amazingly passionate about photography and he's phenomenal at it and he realizes this is probably something he wants to do for the rest of his life, yeah, then you can help guide and yeah. it can, um, um, give them the, the, the ideas behind how to become phenomenal and successful at that but guiding is different than pushing yeah so pushing is like i'm telling i'm kind of yeah. like you the worst things for you could do is tell somebody that they need to find their passion they need to find their purpose because you don't find it and the more you search the less you're going to get it it's like i need you to be happy right now mm. and everyone's searching for happiness these days everyone we've been told that the ultimate success now is not the enlightened ones among us are not pursuing financial success anymore We've found out that financial success doesn't bring happiness, that we should be searching for happiness. You can't search for happiness. It doesn't happen like that. And the more you search for it, the more, uh, the, the more, the farther away it feels. It's something that you actually stumble upon by accident, by actually creating fulfillment. And fulfilled people are happy because when people search for happiness, Guess what? There are things in life that are going to happen that don't make you happy and you're not going to be able to avoid them. It's a part of being a human being. So if we're searching for happiness constantly and we come across these things that don't make you happy, you feel like, oh my God, I'm not happy. What's wrong with me? And now you're unhappy about not being unhappy. You become unhappier. unhappier. What we need to do is instead find fulfillment, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And then what we can do is you can find fulfillment in all sorts of different areas of life. You can be going through horrific times and still feel fulfilled because of the way you're approaching this challenge. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, correlation between the growth and the the fixed mindset and that and that what you're talking about the fulfillment and the happy. Right? Either I'm happy or I'm not happy. That's pretty. That's yeah, pretty fixed. That's fixed. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Versus. Uh, this is hard, but there's something on the other end of that and I, I can figure it out. Yes. It's about like, um, so um, fulfillment is this like enjoyment of the process, yep. right? Which is what the growth mindset is. Yep. It's like, I'm in the process of figuring this thing out and I enjoy this process. Now that might be really, really, really hard right now. And I might not be in like having fun doing this. Yeah. But the process of this is so darn fulfilling. Starting a business, writing a book, getting a six pack, running a marathon, having a successful marriage, those are all really, really hard. If you're searching for happiness at the same time you're doing hard things, particularly never mind the obstacles that come in the way, you're training for a marathon and it snowed six inches. Right. You're trying to get a six pack and you go to a bachelor party. You're trying to have a successful marriage and you have this series of business trips you have to come up with. Like, guess what? Like if you're trying to, Instead, like let's dig into the process of that and dig into finding fulfillment inside the process, not this esoteric happy. Let us leave it there, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks to everybody who sends me questions. Uh, we will see everybody next week. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.